All right, I must now begin to wind up. This is the final talk, and I've got a lot more to pack in, and that clock is racing against me. All right, back to theology, I'm afraid, in this last section, to touch a very deep issue that's been just under the surface all today. And this is where we've got to do something very hard, and that is to unlearn something. I find learning comparatively easy, though as I get older, I told you I'm in my 60th year, and I find learning is not as easy as it used to be. But unlearning is harder than ever. Do you know what I mean by that? changing the way you think about something. We've all grown up under preaching, under certain teaching, which we've assumed was right, and when you look into the Bible, you find it may not be quite right. So we need to unlearn. I find that exciting. I still find new things in the Bible I never saw before. It's exciting, unless you're afraid of new things. Well now, you know the typical sinner's prayer that is used in most evangelism. In fact, I've quoted one in this book, and I'll just read it for you because it's quite typical. It's the one most widely employed. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now, I turn from my sins and open the door of my heart and life. I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you now for saving me. Amen. That's the one that will be most widely used this year in evangelism. It's good as far as it goes, but it's terribly inadequate. Let's just run through the four things. Repentance. What is there in that prayer of repentance? Well, it says, I turn from my sins, but from which sins is the person turning? There's no mention. And repentance is specific. Remember that? There is faith there, but it doesn't say, I believe in you, Jesus. It says, I receive you, which we've seen puts a person on the wrong track. There is nothing in there about baptism in water whatsoever. There is nothing in there about receiving the Holy Spirit. And if you listen carefully, God isn't even mentioned. And you repent toward God, not toward Jesus. You repent toward the one you've hurt and whose laws you've broken. So it is seriously inadequate. And then having given only one and a half of the four steps, it tells the person, and now say thank you for saving me, as if they now are saved. Now I'm sorry, this sounds critical, but that prayer has been used with the majority of people making decisions for Christ in the Western world. And it has given them one and a half out of the four steps that in the New Testament constitute new birth. It means that many people are being passed on to churches as born again when they're hardly born again, when they're half born again, and they need a whole lot more to help them. But if they've already been told you're saved, it's difficult to show them, for example, that baptism in water is part of being saved or that receiving the Spirit is part of being saved. But the real problem, and this is where I come to the theological problem and the deepest root problem we've been skirting around all today, what does that prayer mean by thank you for saving me? What is it to be saved? When somebody asks me, do I need to be baptized to be saved? I just reply with another question. Saved from what? Because that alters the whole question. Now let me try and put up on the board the different views. I wish the board was the other way. I'm going to have to squeeze it a bit. One view of the meaning of saved is safe from hell. That is the most common understanding of what it means to be saved. It is not the New Testament understanding. It's come from American revivalism. And it means that people are primarily hearing the gospel as a fire escape, as an insurance policy for the next world. And they hear preachers say something like, if you die tonight, will you be in heaven or hell? That's not a way that the apostles preached. They were more concerned, if you live tomorrow, will you be living in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness? They were concerned with life more than death. They were preaching a gospel, not of being safe from hell, but of being salvaged from sins plural. Jesus did not come to save us from hell. That's a bonus thrown in. He is called Jesus because he came to save us from our sins. That's why he's called Jesus. He's not a hell saver, he's a sin saver. He's the Lamb of God who came to do what? To take away the sins of the world. Not just to pay the price for them, but to take them away. And until those sins have been taken away from your life, you're not fully saved. You've not been salvaged because this is only concerned with being saved from something. This is concerned not only with being saved from, but seeing being saved to sanctity, a holy life, and being saved for service. In other words, God is in the business, to use a modern word, of recycling people. What is recycling? It's salvaging. It is to take what would be thrown away as rubbish and make it into something useful again. That's salvation. It's not just a ticket to heaven and an escape from hell. It's to be salvaged, recycled, restored to the original image so that again you can love and serve God. That's salvation. And there's no one in this room who is saved. We are all being saved. In other words, salvation is a process that we've begun, but it's not complete yet. 
So I can't say I'm saved. I can say I have started to be saved and I'm being saved and God wants to complete the work he's begun and one day I'll be totally saved. For example, the next time some of you will see me, I will be 33 years old because my body is going to be redeemed and it's going to be made like his glorious body, which as I understand it is in its prime. Jesus is not an old age pensioner staggering around. He's 33, right? That's his age and I'm going to be like him. I can't wait to be 33 again. Can you? Well, not all of you look excited, but some of you do. You see, I'm being saved and the outside of me is not saved yet. Not all the inside is saved yet, but I'm being saved. I'm not what I ought to be and I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm not what I was. I'm in the process of being saved. And I'm not just being saved from something, I'm being saved to something and for something. Jesus, or the Bible does not say that we're, God is able to save us from the uttermost. It says he's able to save us to the uttermost. Most people think that means from the guttermost, but it doesn't. It means to the uttermost. He's able to complete what he's begun. Let's take this a little further. This kind of gospel is concerned with getting people across the line from non-Christian to Christian, from unsaved to saved. It's concerned with that and getting people over that. That's the thinking. But in the New Testament, salvation is a line like that and it's called the way. And someone who's on it is called a disciple. And that word applies to them whether they're here or here. The word Christian I don't like because that implies you're this side of the line. The word disciple says you're on the way. Jack Hayford has a church in America called the Church on the Way. I love that. Not the church that's got everything or the church that's arrived, but the church on the way. Our aim in evangelism is not to get people across the line, but to get them on the way. And it'll take a lifetime to make a disciple. Jesus didn't tell us to go and get decisions. He said, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. If the object of our evangelism is to get converts, we'll be on this side. If our object is to make disciples, we'll be on this. On this side, the most important thing to get is justification. On this side, justification is only the way to sanctification. This side says you come to Jesus as your Savior. This side says you come to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. And you can't accept him as Savior without accepting him as Lord. Are you beginning to see a difference here between the kind of gospel we preach? If you preach this gospel, you say all you need to do is believe, with maybe a little repentance thrown in. If you preach this gospel, you say, repent, believe, be baptized, and receive. Baptism in water and in the Spirit has little to do with being saved from hell. It's got everything to do with being salvaged from sins. Do you understand? If your objective is solely to escape hell, you will not see the point of baptism in water or in Spirit. But if your objective is to be salvaged from your sins and be useful to God again, and be saved that way, then all those things you will need. Let's take this further. This sort of person is only interested in the minimum they need to escape hell. This person is what I call a maximum Christian who wants everything that God can give them to live right. So what kind of Christians are we going to produce? Minimum Christians who got a ticket to heaven? Or are we going to produce Christians who want to be restored to their original condition in which God can use them again because they're no longer perishing? In other words, which do people want to be saved from, hell or their sins? Now anybody is a fool if they don't want to be saved from hell, always assuming there is such a place. And if that's all we offer, I can't see how anybody could refuse to make a decision. But I find this is a different kind of offer. Do you want to say goodbye to your sins? Do you want to be free of those bad habits? Do you want to live right again? I've discovered that deep down people do want to live better lives. They put me on Canadian television for 20 minutes and the producer rashly said, David, you can speak about anything you like for 20 minutes. What would you like to talk about? It was the main network, the global channel. I said, well, I'd like to talk about the kingdom of God. And his face fell. He said, well, now it's a commercial channel. We've got to pe keep people switched on. We've got to keep them interested. I said, I, I don't care whether they keep switched on or not. You said I could speak for 20 minutes about anything I liked. I wish the BBC would say that to me sometime. So I spoke for 20 minutes about the kingdom of God and there were telephones in the studio for people to ring in. And the first telephone went and a woman's voice said, I've been watching your program. I'm a hooker. Now, you may not know what that is. In Canada, that's a prostitute. They also call them solicitors, which makes life a little difficult. But she said, I'm a hooker. I've been watching your program in Yonge Street, Toronto. That's uh, the red light district. And she said, I have a question to ask. I said, what's your question? We were still on camera. And she said, how can I get into that kingdom? I said, why do you want to get in? She said, it's time I got my life straightened out. I thought, hallelujah, we're preaching the same gospel Jesus did. Because when he preached about the kingdom, the prostitutes wanted to get in. You can soon tell if your minister's preaching the right gospel. See who's trying to get in. There's a test, isn't it? But it's good news to people. Christianity is not saying to people, you must live right. It's saying, you can live right. Not you must, you can. Because everything's on offer. 
The only difference between Christianity and all other religions is this. All other religions say sanctification first, justification second. Put yourself right first. Live a holy life first, and then at the end, God will accept you. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is that it's the other way around in Christianity. And only in Christianity, God justifies you before he sanctifies you. He accepts you as his adopted son or daughter, and then he puts you right. He doesn't say, when you've put yourself right, I'll adopt you. He says, I'll adopt you now. But he only justifies us in order to sanctify us. That's an important point. He only forgives so that we can live right. To the woman taken in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn you, but don't do it again. Don't go back. I've forgiven you so that you can live right. That woman, if she lived right, would become useful to God again. She'd be able to love the Lord. Which gospel are we going to preach? An insurance policy for death or a new life that will lead straight on into heaven? A holiness that will lead to happiness. Most people want it the other way around. Most people want happiness here and holiness hereafter. God says, I want to give you holiness here and happiness hereafter. Let's have it the right way around. You see, those who say saved is simply being safe will not know where baptism in water and in spirit fit in. They will tell you all you need to do is to believe, then you've got your ticket, and that's it. But salvation is a process. It starts with justification when God accepts you and forgives you. It goes on to sanctification where he makes you holy, and it goes on to glorification when he gives you a new body and puts you in a new heaven and a new earth, and everything's put back to its original condition. I'm getting overexcited myself now. What a prospect. That's full salvation. And I'm only being saved. And I need all those four basic things to be salvaged. A safe gospel doesn't need those four things. A salvaged gospel does. And the word salvage is much nearer the word salvation than the word safe. God is not here to make us safe. He's here to salvage us, to restore us to the image of his Son. That's going to take years. But God doesn't ever leave a job half done. And as we go on believing, he goes on doing the job. And we're restored day by day until one day you and I will look just like Jesus. But you see, we are being salvaged, not made safe, salvaged, which raises, of course, the knotty question which I've dealt with fully in my book, so I can't delve into it now, this question of once saved, always saved. The trouble is people want to feel safe as quickly as possible. I'm inclined to feel that John Bunyan got it right. At the end of the journey, one of Pilgrim's friends fell. And John Bunyan wrote, then I perceived there was a path to hell even from the gates of heaven. We need to take very seriously the warnings of every writer in the New Testament that it is possible to lose. Hebrews 6 is one of the best known passages and what he says there has nothing to do with can you lose your salvation. He is tackling the question if you do lose it can you get it back again and his answer is no. Jesus said if the salt loses its savor how can it be salted again? Do you know that there were two and a half million people came out of Egypt and only two of them got into Canaan? Two and a half million set out, two arrived. And that incident is used by three different writers of the New Testament as a warning to Christians. You may set out, that doesn't guarantee arrival. But go on believing, for he is able to keep what you've committed. It's very interesting that every time the scripture says God is able to keep you, in the context is another verse that says keep yourself. For example, in Jude, the last verse of Jude says, He is able to keep you from falling. But two verses ahead of that it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. There are two sides to keeping. Keep trusting, and He keeps holding. It's a process of salvation. And I dare to say it, none of us are safe until we stand in glory. But we're being saved. And we need every bit of help we can to keep going, to keep trusting, to press on, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. That is why when you've brought a new convert through these four steps, you have begun. He hasn't arrived, but he's set off from the right departure platform. He will need to be put in a family. Every baby needs a happy family in which they can grow up and be trained. For babies are noisy, they're dirty, they need a lot of attention, they need milk every so often. And some churches are so middle-aged they don't want spiritual babies. Because spiritual babies are noisy, and spiritual babies keep getting dirty, and spiritual babies need a lot of milk and not a lot of meat, and spiritual babies need an awful lot of attention. But pray God you are in a church that loves having babies and knows how to bring them up and teach them how to go on trusting and how to go on observing all that Jesus has taught us until finally we are able to present every man mature in Christ Jesus. My book is only about the start of the Christian life, but we need to keep our eyes on the finish. Well, you've been very patient and listened so well. One final word, I believe God has said to some of you today, you haven't got all the four basic things. And my advice is don't let that put you down. Don't let that discourage you. 
Don't say, oh dear, I don't feel I'm a Christian at all. The devil would love you to feel that. Listen, you are, you are a disciple. You're on the way. All I would say to you is don't rest where you are. Go on after the other things that you don't have until you get them. Have it all. Don't be a minimum Christian. Don't say, well, I get by with what I've got. Say, I want more. There's always more. There's always more. And if you think you've got it all, you haven't. The worst kind of Christians to deal with are those who think they've arrived. But those who know they're on the way always want more. So go out and have babies. Birth them properly. Be good midwives. And then look after them within the family of God until they reach the full measure of the stature of Jesus and have been salvaged and restored to the original image of God that was in them. Let's pray. Father, I just pray now that you will take all this teaching and, and sift it by your Holy Spirit. And if anything I've said is not of you, will you please blot it out from our memories before it misleads or distracts. But if what I've been saying is the truth, then Lord, confirm it from your word and by your spirit so that we may put it into action and we'll be careful to give you all the glory and the praise for it all. You're the Father and these are your babies. This is your family through Jesus Christ our Lord.